in a series on the story of the Bible. We're covering the whole Bible in four weeks. And the reason that we're doing this is that in order to understand all the different parts, understand what Adam and Elijah and Ezekiel and Matthew and Paul and John, to understand what they're all saying, you need to know the story behind what they're saying. Because it's all really one story, and it all fits together if you understand it. And, in fact, what Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah and Daniel and Jonah did back in the Old Testament is so important that their names and their stories are mentioned over and over again in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus talked about all of those guys. And so uh, we need to understand how their story is part of the story of Jesus. And uh, we've actually done this story of the Bible before. The last time was 11 years ago. I figure about once every decade, it's probably good to just step back and tell the whole story and connect all the dots. So that's what we're doing. In the last two weeks, we cover the Old Testament, and today we get to the story of Jesus. Now, for you Bible experts out there, what was the last Old Testament book to be written? Anybody know? Okay, I heard a couple people say Malachi. Well, this was actually a, a kind of a trick question because uh, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, but the Old Testament isn't necessarily in chronological order, is it? And so uh, most experts think the last book to be written actually was Nehemiah because Nehemiah and Malachi lived at the same time. Nehemiah was the governor of Israel. And Malachi was a prophet, and so they think probably Nehemiah was later. But any idea when those two guys lived? About what time? This is kind of an easy question. This is not a trick question, okay? About what time? Well, yeah, it was B.C., duh. Uh, Come on. All right. It's about 400 B.C., okay? Okay. You should remember that number. You know, just to put things in perspective, about 400 years before Christ is when both Malachi and Nehemiah were written. And they were the last written books of the Old Testament, right? 400 years before Jesus, then nothing else is written down for 400 years. But that doesn't mean that nothing else happened. In fact, a lot happened during that time. And to understand the story of Jesus, you need to know what happened before he came. So Nehemiah was governor of Israel about 400 B.C. Seventy years later, in 330 B.C., Alexander the Great swept down from Greece, conquered all of Palestine as well as the rest of the known world, and Greece ruled there for the next 160 years. During this time, the Greeks tried to get everybody to adopt Greek culture. They called it Hellenism. They wanted everybody to be just like them. But some of the Jews didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep their Jewish culture. Well, the Greek ruler said, well, okay, if you're going to be difficult, then we're going to make life really difficult for you. And they became very harsh in dealing with the Jews. They tried to wipe out Jewish worship, wipe out Jewish uh, customs, and eventually it became so bad that one of the Jews had kind of a, a Popeye moment. And he said, that's all I can stand, and I can't stand no more. And the guy was named Judas Maccabeus. And in fact, I, I put his picture on the, the next slide. Um, you know, somebody, some of you uh, probably don't know that Judas Maccabeus looks like this. Uh, but uh, this is new information. Anyway, uh, in 167 BC, Judas Maccabeus led a revolution against the Greeks. And amazingly enough, the Jews won against the Greeks the most powerful nation of the world at the time. They won. They threw the Greeks out. They became an independent country again for a 100 years. It's a long time. But there was a critical moment during that war when thousands of devout Jews chose not to fight because it was the Sabbath day. And they were slaughtered as a result. And because of that devastating experience, the Jews started to do a lot of thinking about life after death. And many Jews became convinced during this time that there was life after death. Now, to us, it sounds like a no-brainer. Well, of course there's life after death. But you see, if you study the Old Testament, there is not much taught 
about life after death. It was a very fuzzy idea to many of the Jews back then. And so a lot of Jews during that time did not believe in life after death. You know, it wasn't until Jesus came that we really have clear teaching on this. Jesus says things like, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. And, you know, whoever believes in me will never die. And, and so it's very clear. But in the Old Testament times, they were not too sure about this whole area. And that's why in the hundred years before Christ, the Jewish religious leaders split into two camps. There were the Sadducees who didn't believe in life after death. And so they were more open to working with the Roman rulers, and they became politically powerful. And then there were the Pharisees who did believe in life after death, and, and they were still hoping for a Messiah to come and lead us uh, to military victory, and so they were considered more revolutionary. Well, the Romans conquered Israel in 63 B.C. They, uh, they were the ones who ended that hundred years of Maccabean rule. But from the moment the Romans came to power, there were constant rebellions because the Jews figured, well, we kicked the Greeks out. We can do the same thing to the Romans. Let's get rid of them. But each rebellion against the Romans was put down with ruthless force by the Roman Empire. So it was a very common thing to see Jewish rebels hanging on crosses. In fact, I put a picture on the next slide of, of what uh, this might have looked like. Uh, in the same year G- Jesus was born, the Roman general Varus lined the road from Sepphoris to Galilee with 2,000 crucified Jewish rebels. And that's the society into which Jesus was born. Uh, The only story the Bible tells us from his childhood is the amazing story of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy in the temple discussing and arguing with the theologians about Scripture. Now, a 12-year-old boy, that's like a sixth grader. You know, that's like a sixth grader coming in here and debating and and arguing and, and, you know, talking with me about this whole story of the Bible and am I doing it right? You know, to me, that's, that's almost incomprehensible. But... Yeah, it says in Luke 2.47, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And so that tells us a couple things. First of all, it tells us that Jesus was a master of the scriptures, even from a very young age. And so it's no surprise that during his ministry, even his enemies addressed him as rabbi or teacher. He, he knew the scriptures backward and forward. The second thing we know from the story is that he grew up with an intimate knowledge of God as his father. Jesus used the word Abba when talking about his father. It's the most intimate word that could be used for father. It's like when a child today says, Daddy. And it was not a word that was ever used by any of the other Jews for God the Father. But Jesus used it because he knew from early on who his real dad was. Well, one day, he's about 30 years old, and the news reached Jesus about this guy named John the Baptist, who was preaching and baptizing people in the Jordan River. Jesus hears this, and he says, okay, it's time to go. It's time to leave the carpenter shop. And so he laid down his tools for the last time, and he started walking along the road about 90 miles down from the hills of Galilee to the valley of Jordan River. And he comes to be baptized by John the Baptist as just another person in a crowd of sinners. He makes no distinction between himself and them. And, of course, the moment John sees him, the Holy Spirit immediately reveals, hey, this is the Messiah. And John doesn't want to baptize him because, for one thing, Jesus hasn't done any sin to repent of. But Jesus insists this is how it has to be. Why? Because Jesus knew that he didn't have any sin of his own, But he was going to be taking the whole sin of the world on himself. And so he wants to be baptized in advance right along with the rest of the sinners. And then the two other members of the Trinity show up for the baptism, the Holy Spirit and the Father. First, the Holy Spirit descends as a dove and anoints Jesus with power to carry out his ministry on earth. And then the Father speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And that is the start of Jesus' ministry on earth. And then the first thing that happens in his ministry is extremely significant. Immediately he was led by this Holy Spirit into the wilderness. I was in Israel a year ago. I, I can tell you, you don't have to go very far from the Jordan River to be in the wilderness. You get a half mile away from the river, you're in the desert. 
And uh, so Jesus goes there for 40 days, no food, to be tempted by the devil. Have you ever had something like that happen to you? You're, you start something new, you think this is God's will, you think he's going to bless it, but instead of it starting off great, it starts off really hard. And maybe it's really painful. Maybe you just feel like quitting. The truth is your life is a spiritual battle. And the battle for your life is won or lost in the spiritual realm, whether you recognize it or not. That was true for Jesus And it's true for us. And so before Jesus could do anything else in his ministry, he had to overcome the devil in a spiritual battle of temptation. And Luke tells us something really interesting about when when Jesus went into the desert, it says he was full of the Spirit. But when he was done, after the temptations and trials, it says he returned in the power of the Spirit. Before the temptation, full of the Spirit. That's great. But after the temptation, in the power of the Spirit. That's even better. In other words, he gained power by going through and overcoming temptation. And you and I gain spiritual power when we face and overcome temptation. In fact, sometimes God will allow you to be tempted just so that you can overcome it and grow in spiritual power. So Jesus comes back from the desert in the power of the Holy Spirit, ready now to start his ministry on earth. And he starts by going into Galilee, and he, he's preaching, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and follow me. Now, this was not a brand new concept to the Jews. They believe in God's kingdom. They know they have to repent and change their ways. But what was different to them was that they thought that God's kingdom was something really far off, something in the distant future or something maybe up in heaven, but it doesn't operate right here and right now. But Jesus says, it is here, it is now. Even though you can't see it because you're looking at it the wrong way, you're expecting the wrong thing, it it is not a political kingdom, it's not a religious thing, it's me, it's Jesus. Jesus himself is the presence of, of God's rule on earth. So he says, the kingdom is here because I'm here. And so Jesus says, if you want to know what the kingdom is like, follow me. Come to me and you'll learn. Now, of course, some people completely rejected that idea and tried to kill him. Others are so amazed at him that the crowds follow him everywhere he goes, especially when he starts healing the sick and casting out demons and, and when he fed 5,000 people out of nothing and came from, you know, people came from everywhere to see him. But the truth is, Jesus didn't want the crowds. He wanted only a, a few committed uh, uh, followers that he could make disciples of, that he could go build his church with. And so Jesus teaches the crowds using parables or stories, knowing that they won't understand much of it. And he waits until he's alone with his disciples until he actually explains what the stories mean. Why didn't he want large crowds of followers? It's because the crowds want to come and make him king by force. They want him to be a military leader and throw the Romans out of Israel. They they remember the Maccabees who threw out the Greeks, right? And so they want Jesus to do the same. They want him to be the new Judas Maccabeus. And so Jesus spoke in parables, and and for the people who do understand, his parables show again and again the picture that God has been painting ever since the Garden of Eden of God, the loving Father, who so desperately wants a relationship with the children that he's created And the parables show how much he loves us and how much when we reject him, our father feels a sense of deep loss. For example, Luke chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, Jesus tells three stories in a row about the father based on the loss of something valuable. He says, my father's like a shepherd who has 99 sheep in the fold and, and, and the 99 are fine and he should be happy. He's got the 99. They're, they're, you know, he's only missing one. 
But the shepherd loves those sheep so much that he cannot stop, he cannot rest if even one little sheep is missing. And so he goes and he searches and he searches everywhere until he finds that one lost sheep. And then he carefully carries it home in his arms and he calls all his neighbors and says, come celebrate with me, I found my lost sheep that I love so much. And Jesus says, you are that lost sheep. And God is crazy about you, and he will never stop until he finds you. And then Jesus says in the next story, my father's like a woman who had ten coins, but but one is lost, and she should probably be okay, because, you know, it's it's just, she's still got nine coins, she's only missing one, it's not that big a deal, right? But instead of just blowing it off, she goes crazy with concern and turns the whole house upside down, searching every nook and cranny, and she just refuses to give up until she finally finds it. And when she does find it, oh, man, she's so excited. She calls the neighbor, and she's come celebrate with me. We're going to have a party because I found my lost coin. Jesus says, you are that lost coin. And God is so concerned with you. You are so valuable to him. He will never, ever stop looking for you. And then Jesus says in the next story, God is like a father who has a son. It's a son who rejects him, a son who rebels against him, takes half of his money and blows it and goes to live in a a far country. And every morning the father wakes up in the morning and his first thought is of his lost son. Every day he goes out to the road and he looks way, way down the road as far as he can see, hoping to see his son coming down that road. And he thinks, maybe today, maybe today, maybe today will be the day when my son will come home to me. And when his son finally does come home, oh, he is so excited. He runs down the road. He grabs his his son in a huge hug to his heart. And and then he throws a huge party to celebrate that his lost son has been found. And Jesus says, you are that lost son. And God waits and he waits for you to come home. He will never rest. He will never be happy until you're back in his arms because he loves you more than you can imagine. Jesus says that to each one of us. That's the love that you were made for. That's the love that you were created for. That's why God created you, to share that precious, powerful love. And the crowds are thinking, wow, this is really different. I thought God just wanted us to show up at church and obey some rules. So Jesus tells one after another these parables of the Father's love for us and his desire for us to be with him. And of course, the people back then didn't even understand half of it, but what they do understand is that Jesus is different from the other teachers. Jesus speaks with authority. But he doesn't just speak with authority. He acts with authority. He heals everybody who comes around him. He casts out demons left and right. In fact, there were three primary things that Jesus did in his ministry. And those three things aren't by accident. They're, they're part of the plan, part of the purpose. In, in fact, 1 John 3, 8 tells us what that purpose is. The Son of God appeared for this purpose. What was it? To destroy the works of the devil. Well, what does that mean? What are the works of the devil? The devil's work affects every part of our lives, physical, spiritual, and mental. And so Jesus destroyed the devil's works in those three areas. The physical works of the devil are disease and sickness, so Jesus healed people. The spiritual works of the devil include demon possession, so Jesus cast out demons from people. The mental work of Satan caused people to believe lies about who God was and what God wanted from them. And so Jesus told them the truth in his powerful teaching. And so Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil because he knows that the true enemy is not Rome like the Jewish people thought it was. Jesus didn't even care about Rome. He knew Rome was just another tool being used by God. The real enemy is Satan. Satan is the one who people are really in bondage to, and so Jesus wants to defeat Satan and destroy his works. And the main battleground between Jesus and Satan is over the minds of the people because, you know, demons are no challenge. For Jesus, he just says, come out, and and they leave. Sickness and disease, no problem. You know, he just says, be healed, and they are. But the real battle comes from the fact that the Jews were just too religious. 
Satan had built this religious empire right in the middle of God's chosen people so that the people are so focused on a bunch of little rules that they completely missed God. And so Satan is going, yeah, way to go, guys. Keep doing all your little rules, those rules that are actually keeping you away from God. And that is still a temptation for religious people today. They obey the rules but ignore the relationship. So Jesus tells them, you've missed the point, and you've missed God. He says it so strongly that he offends a lot of people. He says things like, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you whitewashed tombs, your father is the devil. I mean, wouldn't you be offended if he said that to you? Yeah. People often have an image of of Jesus as, you know, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And, And that's partially true. You know the people he was really gentle to? were the sinners and the rejects of society. But the truth is, Jesus was constantly offending the religious people. Why? First, Jesus doesn't act the way they expect. He doesn't act religious enough. Second, he doesn't care about military or political power, and so they can figure out what he's up to. And third and most important, Jesus offended people because his whole message was about himself. They didn't get that. He said things like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I'm the bread of life that comes down out of heaven. He said, I'm the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He said, before Abraham was even born, I am, using a name reserved only for God. And he says, the real issue isn't as much what you believe or what you do. It's your relationship with me. So come, follow me. So he offended a lot of people, and especially religious people. Even John the Baptist wasn't sure what to make of him. John the Baptist is in prison. He can't understand what Jesus is up to, and so he sends disciples to ask, are you the Messiah or not? Jesus answers, go and tell John what you see. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended by me. Jesus knew even John had the potential to be offended by him. And many, many were offended. Even many of his followers were offended and they quit following him. Though the twelve disciples stayed with him. And that was okay with Jesus because he only wanted a few disciples anyway. Just a few who could begin to understand what he's really about and what his coming really meant. And, and so they could build his church after he's gone. Well, in his final week before the cross, Jesus went to Jerusalem to the temple, which was the heart of the religious opposition. And there he told his most significant parable of all, the one that was guaranteed to make the Jews just explode in rage. It was a parable about the owner of a vineyard, who rented the vineyard out to tenants. Jesus takes this parable from the book of Isaiah where it calls Israel God's vineyard. But Jesus told it, told the story with a new twist. He says, yes, Israel is God's vineyard, and, and God, as any owner would do, sends his servants year after year to collect the fruit of the vineyard which the tenants owe to him the fruit of righteousness and justice, mercy and love. But Jesus tells that when the servants show up and collect the fruit, they're treated rudely. They're sent away empty-handed. They're treated badly and beaten or even killed. And the servants in this story are really the prophets that God has sent to Israel. Nathaniel talked about them last week. These prophets were often ignored and treated rudely, laughed at, despised, thrown in prison, some, some even killed. And then Jesus goes on with the story. The owner of the vineyard gets more and more upset. And finally the owner says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my own son. Surely they'll treat him with respect. And so he sends his only son, the son that he loves. But instead of respecting his son... They kill him. And then Jesus asks them a loaded question. What will the owner of the vineyard do? 
And Jesus answers the question himself. He says, the owners will come himself and kill those wicked tenants and give the vineyard to others. Now, most of the parables Jesus told, the people really couldn't understand very well. But when Jesus told this story, it was immediately clear exactly what he meant. There was no doubt. Jesus was telling them, you may reject me, God's son. You may even kill me, but then God will come and remove you from your place as the chosen people of God, and God will give his vineyard to others. The religious leaders heard this, and they were furious. This was absolutely the last straw. There was no longer any doubt in their minds that Jesus had to be destroyed. Shortly after this, Jesus gathers his disciples together for a last meal, He doesn't say a whole lot, but he does something much more significant than anything he could say. He takes the bread of their meal, he breaks it and gives it to them, and he says, Take it, eat, in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. And then he takes his cup and and he gives thanks, and he, he gives it to him, and he says, Drink, this is the blood of the new covenant. What was he talking about, the new covenant? Well, Remember a couple weeks ago, Nathaniel <clears throat> talked about the covenant with Moses, which contained all the laws people had to uh, follow, and the, the laws that none of us could follow perfectly. Well, with his death on the cross, Jesus completed a new covenant that fulfilled the old covenant, so we don't have to. And in fact, Jeremiah gave us a prophecy about this. He said, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with you, Not like the one I made with Moses, because she broke that one. The new covenant won't be written on tablets of stone, but I'll put my instructions deep in you. I'll I'll write it on the tablet of your heart. The Holy Spirit will be living in you to show you what to do. And that covenant could only come into effect through the death of Jesus, because it was a blood covenant. The old covenant was made with the blood of goats and bulls. This new covenant was made by the blood of Jesus the Lamb of God on the cross. And that's why Jesus says to his disciples, take this bread and wine to remember the new covenant, to remember my sacrifice for you on the cross. And of course, the disciples had no idea at the time what this meant, but later on, they remembered, and then they understood. Well, from the Last Supper, Jesus goes down the light, long flight of steps from Mount Zion, where the Last Supper was, down to the Garden of Gethsemane. When I was in Israel, I walked down those same steps. Some of them are, the stone steps are still there from 2,000 years ago. And his disciples are with him, and they think they're still loyal to him, although he knows they'll run as soon as trouble comes. An hour later, he comes back up those same steps. This time, he's under arrest in chains to be tried and condemned, mocked and humiliated and crucified. The disciples are crushed, devastated, shattered. They all fled. Only one of them even came to the crucifixion. That was John, although some of the women showed up. And they would have stayed scattered, and the whole thing would have been over, except that on the third day, as we know, Jesus rose, and he met with his disciples, convinced them he was still alive. He sent them out to tell the good news of the kingdom to the whole world. It was a great victory. Jesus had won back from Satan all that Adam and Eve lost when they rebelled in the garden. Now, after his resurrection, some people wonder why Jesus actually stayed around on earth for for 40 days after that. Remember how Jesus endured the temptation in the wilderness for 40 days at the beginning of his ministry. Well, now the tables are turned. Jesus walking around openly proclaiming his victory over the devil for 40 days. And he used that time to appear to over 500 followers, removing any doubts about his resurrection. But then after 40 days, the time came for his ascension into heaven. And as the disciples watched him ascend on a cloud, two angels appeared in front of them and said, Why do you stand there looking into heaven? Jesus will come back in the same way as you saw him go up to heaven. I'd like the worship band to come up for a closing song. But as they come up, notice they said, Jesus will come back in the same way.
In fact, Jesus told us what that day would look like. He said, all the nations will see me coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So he's going to come back the same way. But let me assure you that when he comes again, it's going to be a little different this time. The first time he came as a baby, the next time he will come as king of kings and lord of lords. The first time he came, a bright star shone over his birthplace. The next time he comes, Scripture says, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. The first time he came, wise men and shepherds brought him gifts. The next time he comes, he will bring the gifts and rewards for his followers. The first time he came, there was no room for him. The next time he comes, the whole world will not be able to contain his glory. The first time he came, only a few saw his arrival, some shepherds and wise men. The next time he comes, every eye will see him throughout the earth. The first time he came, very few knew who he was. The next time he comes, it will be immediately clear to the whole world exactly who he is. The first time he came, he wore a crown of thorns. The next time he comes, he will be crowned with many crowns. The first time he came, men rejected and killed him. The next time he comes, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So let me ask this morning, are you ready for when he comes again? Let's stand for prayer. As we bow together, if you're not sure that you're ready for Jesus to come again, if you're not sure that you're ready for your own death, if you're not sure that you're ready to face tomorrow without his power, then why don't you pray with me and you can be ready. Just say something like this in your heart. Jesus, thank you so much for coming to earth so that I could get to know what God is like. For living a life here so that we could hear your teaching and see you destroy the works of the devil. For dying for my sins so I could be forgiven. And then rising to new life so I can have new life in you. I believe this, Jesus. And I ask you to be my Lord and be my Savior as much as I know how. Would you put your Holy Spirit in me to give me power to follow you? I do want to follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.